is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Rebels, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 183. Today, I'm talking to Rebecca Thorne all about how to use TikTok to sell books in a niche. But first to last week's question, which was, what's the best April Fool's you've ever done, witnessed or heard about? Ian Worrell said, I play pranks quite often, although I don't think I ever did one on April Fool's Day. One time in high school, I was waving a pencil in front of a classmate's face and said, try to get my pencil. His response was, and if I get it, I'm going to throw it out the window. And so he got the pencil and announced to the class, Ian's been bugging me with his stupid, stupid pencil, and he threw it out the window like he said he would. The teacher was out of the room at this time. As he, as he sat there laughing, I let him laugh. laugh. <laughs> I just read the ending. Oh my goodness me. As he sat there laughing, I let him laugh for a few seconds, and then I broke the news. That was your pencil. <laughs> and the smile immediately disappeared from his face and he said that was my pencil you asshole and somehow didn't see me take his pencil off the desk right in front of him and I tricked him into throwing his own pencil out of the window I absolutely absolutely love that it's almost the rebellion of the week before we've had a rebellion of the week oh it's so fun this week's question is what aspect of book marketing do you find hardest to grasp the book recommendation of the week this week is only one coffin by aj truman this was recommended to me by jeff adams who was on um i don't a couple of episodes ago when we were talking about um, accessible content uh, and Jeff is also the host of the Big Gay Fiction podcast and he recommended that's actually um, <laughs> Duchess. <laughs> oh. Anyway, uh, she's trying to podcast apparently but uh, Only One Coffin was recommended to me and it is a, it's, it's, mm, it's either a long novella or a short novel and it's got uh, vampires who with forced proximity because they're forced to share a single coffin and it is a grumpy sunshine book as well and I literally devoured it I loved it it was so fun like the grumpy sunshine was so well done and it was just like a shred of joy and uh, it's male male romance as well so in personal news and updates I have finished drafting a game of Romance and Ruin. Um, So I checked all the trackers yesterday when I finished because I convinced myself that I was writing this book for months and months and months. And I think because I had a full start in January and I wrote 30k, which I ended up throwing, um, it felt like I had been writing this book forever. But I actually started on the 20th of February and I finished on the 21st of March, so a calendar month. Although when I looked at the tracker, I'd actually only sat down uh, for 12 writing sessions. So that that's actually shorter than um, A Game of Hearts and Heist, which at that point was my quickest. I think that was 16 sessions. Um, that said, this book is slightly shorter. So Hearts and Heist was 70k first draft. This was 66k. So 4,000 words less. Um, and it does feel like it's going to be an 80,000 word book. So I do have quite a bit of um, uh, adding to do and sorting out and sewing all these threads. But oh my goodness gracious me. I, I don't want to like speak too soon, but I... <laughs> this book two might top book one in terms of like, okay, it's my opinion. (laughs) But I think I might even like this book more than, no, I don't know. How can I possibly say it? I don't, like, I don't want to pick favourite books, but all I'm saying is book two. (laughs) When I was drafting last week, I just came up with twist after twist after twist. And this book did not play ball in any way, shape or form. It didn't adhere to... (laughs) the outline um the twists changed things like it's a hot mess right now but because of the twists that I came up with I genuinely think that I might love this book even more than book one and I can't believe I'm even saying that because how can I possibly love it more when I loved book one so much I still love book one so much um so yeah I'm like super super excited I'm now in a bit of a quandary because 
obviously I am being pulled back to nonfiction. Like I want to do nonfiction, but I'm also on a roll with the fiction. And I sort of feel like you need three books before you can really have any kind of marketing flexibility. So I'm trying to decide strategically what the best option would be in terms of like what I do next project wise. I'm definitely going to launch a nonfiction this calendar year. I I think I've only missed one calendar year uh, since I left my day job. No, sorry, since I started publishing, I've only missed one calendar year for nonfiction. I seem to average like one nonfiction book a year and that is just it. Like I can't seem to do any more. I keep saying I'm going to try for more and I just never do more than one a year. So perhaps that that is just I just do that consistently and that's that. Um, So I I think that I'm probably going to aim for November now. Um, If I can do it earlier than that, I will. Uh, but I would also like to get a course out this year. So I'm just, yeah, I'm I'm like looking at the rest of this year and the months that I have left with the kids still in school <laughs> and what I can like legitimately squeeze in based on what I know about how long everything takes me. So I'm, I'm really excited because I know for sure what the third book is going to be. Um, I, I know the, the trope. I don't quite know how it's going to work yet, but... Um, Yeah, I'm excited. I also have no idea what the title's going to be. But uh, so I have a feeling I might do that. I'm not not entirely sure. But anyway, I finished the book last night and it is the 22nd of March as I uh, say this. So it's Wednesday, the 22nd of March. And I finished on a stonking day. I did 8,678 words. So that was like I don't know, I just got on a complete focus tunnel. Uh, It's funny because I left the desk at like 11 o'clock last night and um, I was like, oh, I feel sick. And then I was like, why do I feel sick? And then I remembered I hadn't eaten for like about 10 hours. (laughs) Like, what am I? Honestly, these focus tunnels are like the best and worst things ever for me because like I can smash work out because there is just nothing else existing other than me and the page and getting the words out. But then also I end up feeling sick at 11 o'clock at night. So that wasn't great. Um, however, I am like so pumped and excited. And the only reason I don't sound it is because it's like mm, 10 o'clock at night and my son is asleep upstairs in the in literally the, the room above me. So I can't be really loud. I was like, I was told very clearly, do not be loud. So uh, I'm trying to be quiet. <laughs> but all I want to do is get like high pitched and squealy for you because that's how I'm feeling on the inside. Oh, I am so excited to release this next book. I'm so excited to write the next one. I'm just like this whole fucking process of writing sapphic fiction is just filling me with joy. I am so optimistic about the rest of this year. I am so excited for the rest of this year. I'm excited to write more things. I'm excited to write my non-fiction things. Basically, I'm in a real good place and also completely high off finishing the book. So, you know, if I'm like in a massive slump next week because I'm editing, don't blame me. Okay, fair warning, guys. Okay. I don't think I have any other updates. So let's go straight on to Rebel of the Week. So the Rebel of the Week this week is Heather Heather says, in 1993, I was in grade eight and just coming into myself. I'd been ostracized for the last two years for no other reason than my small school needed someone to bully and chose me. I I feel that personally. I had been making strides to be my nerdy self, not so much more, more cool, but just no longer caring. I did things like purposefully sitting at the back of the bus and forcing my bus mates <laughs> to accept me unless they wanted to lose status by giving up the cool section in the back of the bus, you legend. Late spring in grade eight, circa 1993, and this nerd was bored in math class. I'd already finished all the textbook lessons and was listening to my generally grumpy male teacher go over questions. Think bed mass, he wasn't very good at it. One of my male classmates said they thought one answer in the textbook was wrong and the teacher agreed with it. Well, they were wrong. I raised my hand and was ignored. So I raised my hand again and said that their answer was wrong. The teacher disagreed. I got frustrated. This wasn't the first time he'd ignored the girls who made up two thirds of my class. So I stood up and said that they were wrong and marched from the back row to the front of the class I took the chalk and said I'll prove it then proceeded to fix his mistakes (laughs) when I was done I handed him back the chalk and then sat back down at my desk as if nothing happened 
The teacher shut his textbook and signalled that we were changing subjects. I didn't think anything else of it, used to being ignored. Later that day, I was buzzed with a few others... Oh, sorry. Later that day, I was buzzed with a few others uh, to our area concert band rehearsal. I think I mentioned I was a nerd. When my mum picked me up, some of the other girls told her about how I'd gotten up and stood up to the teacher and proved him wrong. Exaggerated my I'll prove it statement as if I was in a TV show. My mum, always my biggest supporter, smiled and grinned at the way they idolised me in that moment. For the rest of the school year, despite being held back from get- getting the math award, I was the coolest girl in school because I'd stood up to a teacher for- and proved him wrong. I absolutely love that. Also, do you know what annoys me so fucking much is that your teacher did not acknowledge and recognise that you were right and he was wrong? Like, the ego on that man, honestly, like, you were schooled, son. Get the fuck over it and admit your mistake. Like, why? Oh, 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 annoys me so much. Oh, okay. If you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, or something in between. It doesn't even need to be your rebellion. It could be a grand rebellion. We all know I love them. It could be a historical rebellion. It could be a recent rebellion. It could be a pet rebellion. You can email your story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. No new patrons this week, but a huge thank you to all of my existing patrons. You guys are amazing and you make me feel like what I do is worthwhile and that it's helpful. And I just love spending the time with you, especially in Slack. So uh, if you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. This episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author-first approach is one of the reasons they developed a promotions tool. This is an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers. They offer lots of promotions that don't require you to drop your price because they know when you're publishing wide, it can be a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. Any promotions listed as a percent off, e.g. 40% VIP sale, mean you don't have to change your price as the discount will be provided by promo code at checkout. If that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales, where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to Kobo. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers all about it. The promotions tool is updated on a weekly basis, so make sure you're taking a regular look to see what's on offer and if there's an opportunity that matches your books and marketing plans. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll enable this for you. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and find them on social. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. Hey, that's it from me today. Let's get on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. I am really excited for today's guest. I met today's guest on TikTok. However, um, I had already been following her career. So today I am joined by Rebecca Thorne. Rebecca is an author of all things fantasy, sci-fi and romance. She thrives on deadlines, averages 2,700 words a day and tries to write at least three books a year. She might also be a little hyper-focused ADHD. After years operating in the traditional publishing space, Rebecca has pivoted into self-publishing. She released her first women-loving women cozy fantasy in September titled Can't Spell Treason Without Tea. She is also obsessed with TikTok and will happily spend all day scrolling through videos. When she's not writing or avoiding writing, Rebecca can be found traveling the country as a flight attendant or doing her best impression of a granola girl hermit with her two dogs. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And we said it before, but your voice is just 
just perfect. <laughs> just oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so before we dive into like Yvette, so my first question is always tell everyone a little bit about you and your journey, because I think it's a very interesting one. And the position that you're in now is fascinating to me. It's been a long one. Um, so I feel like people on TikTok, because I've only been there for about, you know, since February of last year, really, and I didn't even start amping it up until the summer. Um, people, I think, just kind of assume that I came out of nowhere. But if you know me, I've been in the traditional publishing space for about eight years before that point. Um, so I've been writing since I was 11. I hit a point um, right after college where I started my nine to five, which I say is a nine to five. I was a flight attendant and I still am. Um, and so I started my day job and I realized that that was all I was ever going to be if I didn't start taking my writing more seriously. So I went out and I consumed every craft writing book I could find. And at 24, I entered the querying trenches with um, one book that didn't get anywhere. And then I had another book that didn't get anywhere. And then I had a third book and that one got me my literary agent. Um, and I was with her for four years. And then last May, I read Legends and Lattes and realized that there was an opportunity there. And so I left my agent, did the self-publishing thing, and that is how I found my success. So it's been a very long journey. I feel like there will always be people who look at my journey and say, oh my gosh, look at her. She just became a success overnight. And like nothing ever in this industry happens overnight. <laughs> but I do, I mean, it was a lot of luck and a lot of timing. Um, and I was very fortunate to be able to see the cozy fantasy wave coming you know, nine months ago and jump on it at a time when no one else was really paying attention. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody who makes it appears to have just come out of nowhere. And to mm -hmm. somebody who didn't know them before that, they did just come out of nowhere. But mm -hmm. they always forget that there are years of trying and effort behind it. One of yep. the interesting things um, about your journey is that you don't want to leave your day job. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think this is a really important perspective for a lot of listeners who maybe do have the dream to write full time, but actually maybe that doesn't suit them but the only dream that we are shown in this industry is to write full-time and mm -hmm. and you know I think it's and I I say this as a British author who doesn't have to pay medical insurance I, <laughs> I genuinely think it's easier for people not in America to be full-time and 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 you know that's not there are so many no, extenuating circumstances behind around that, I mean, but that yeah. is such a huge issue mm -hmm. for so many people who go self-employed in America yep. so anyway I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that yeah so I mean I started as a flight attendant a decade ago my mom was a flight attendant my sister's a flight attendant so it's in the family oh wow um, and, yeah and um I did two different airlines I was with United Airlines for a year and then I went to Southwest Airlines and I've been there since I mean, God, 2014. Um, and it's one of those things where I love my day job because it gives me perspective. You know, I'm from a very white focused community. I mean, like the area that I'm from is very Mormon. Um, I'm not Mormon, but that's the that's the experience I grew up with. You know, um, no surprise that I didn't figure out I was gay until I was like 27. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it, it was, it was a very, it's a very white focused area. And I think that getting out and working, I mean, I meet new people every, every trip. So every three days I'm working with three new people that I've never met before. We have 16,000 flight attendants in Phoenix alone. Um, and there's 21, 25,000 of us spread around the country. So, I mean, we have all backgrounds, all communities, all cultures, and I'm working with them for three days at a time. And then I, and then the passengers on the plane, you know, I mean, I have, a, I deal with 143 passengers on every flight and sometimes I work four flights a day. So you have to imagine I'm meeting upwards of 700 people a day and I'm really, truly getting to talk to 700 people a day in every, from every place in the country. So are you an extrovert? Because I'm dying on the inside. You know, it's, it's funny because my <laughs> sister's an introvert um, and I actually used to count myself as an extrovert. And now I call myself an ambivert because on my days on, like when I'm working, I am social as shit. Yeah. On my days off, I close all the blinds and I become a hermit. Like I was not joking about that granola girl hermit thing. Like I literally don't go out with anybody that is not my immediate circle um, yeah. when I'm home because I'm, I'm socializing so much when I'm gone. So. I, I'm also an ambivert because I think in a very extroverted way, like I, there's mm -hmm. nothing I love more than bouncing ideas with friends. But yeah. then like in order to recover or like rest as people keep telling me to do um I I I have to like be alone in my duvet with my book and like that's yep. it nobody around that kind of yeah, yeah exactly like that's what writing is for me like writing becomes that retreat where I can go to my hotel room after a long day of socializing and turn off the world and just like focus on me and mine you know 
Um, but one reason that I, I love bringing this up is that I, I learned somewhere probably about five years ago that if you want, if your passion and your hobby is um, more introverted, so like writing, reading, that kind of thing, it's better to have an extroverted job because that helps balance you out um, and vice versa. So I have a lot of friends who went into writing careers and a lot of them don't write for fun anymore because they write all day for work and then they come home and the last thing they want to do is turn on their computer and write. Um, so I think it's something worthwhile to note that getting out and doing jobs that work with your hands, that get you off of a computer, those kinds of jobs actually can help foster the creative spirit when you get home because you're not burnt out from that type of work. Um, so I think that's why it's easy for me to say that I won't quit my day job because I get so much experience out in the world. I get to see so many people and meet so many people. Um, and then I get to come home and it's like a moment of peace and quiet, you know, like I can, I can focus on my writing that way. So, is there ever a figure you could hit with fiction income that would make you quit? No, <laughs> no, Amazing. I, don't, I, I, I think they, I think Southwest would have to pry me off of the spatula. <laughs> <laughs> like they'd have to pry me off the airplane. Um, oh, I love no, it. I think I, I just I here's the thing. Southwest Airlines is very unique in terms of a job because I don't have to go to work in order to keep my benefits and my health insurance. Um, and you know, in the US, that's huge. Health insurance is huge. I have amazing health insurance. I have fantastic benefits. And Southwest contract, the way that our union has worked our contract is that we are allowed to drop down to zero hours at any time and not work for months on end. Um, so when I say that I won't quit my job, it means that I will not leave Southwest payroll, but there may be months where I drop down to zero hours to focus on writing. I did that in January. Um, I was able to very easily just get rid of all of my trips. You know, Southwest saw that I got rid of them and they're like, okay, they're covered. We don't really care where she is in the meantime. Um, and then I was able to go in and write that month. And now that that book is done, I'm back to flying. So it, it really is a very like kind of, hit or miss type of thing. Like, I do think that there would be a period where I might move somewhere further away because I'm finally senior enough that I'm not on reserve, um, which means that I have a little bit more freedom about where I could choose to live. So, and that gets complicated and I won't get into it, but I do think that I would move away from an airport and then probably drop down to, you know, one trip a month or two trips a month um, and work six days and then still write the rest of the time, which feasibly is still full-time writing. Um, but I won't leave Southwest paper. The, the benefits are too good. Oh my God. No, I, th I just, I, I think this is amazing. And like, I think it's so important for listeners to get those other perspectives because so many of us are just blindsided by only seeing must write full time, must write full time. And the thing is, is that actually looks different to everybody and it looks different to, for so many different reasons. So yeah, I really appreciate um, you being so candid about that. Um, yeah. Okay, so we are here to talk. Um, I always said to TikTok about TikTok. That's hard for me to say. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned that you started TikTok back in February, but didn't really get going. So I wonder if you could talk through your journey and your journey in relation to the book launch and release as well. So this book was very interesting for me. It started with Legends and Lattes. Um, I was represented by a literary agent. Uh, we got my middle grade book traditionally published uh, with a mid-level press. And um, I felt like I was kind of stagnating in that type of career. So I was already kind of contemplating leaving. I had another book that my agent didn't really seem to know what to do with. And it was very easy for me to imagine self-publishing it instead now that I saw what TikTok could do when I was on it and kind of watching these other authors make their way. Um, and then I went to Barnes & Noble one day and I found Legends and Lattes on the shelf. And I'd seen it on TikTok before. And I looked and I was like, that book is self-published. And I bought into this narrative before that you cannot get into Barnes and Noble unless you are traditionally published, right? Like that's, that's how they make their money is by pushing that narrative and making people who aren't really in the know think that the only way to get your book into major bookstores is by traditional publication, you know, and it keeps people in this kind of, and I won't say rat race because I have a lot of respect for traditional publication and I'm still definitely pursuing aspects of it. But I think that it's important to acknowledge that there is a new way to publish coming up and it is going to basically overtake the world because we can pivot. You know, indie publishers are fast at responding to trends. And in a world where, you know, traditional publishing will take, and mark my words, it will take another three years for traditional publishing to truly jump on the cozy fantasy bandwagon. And I'm talking like for the time that it takes Barnes and Noble to have a cozy fantasy section in their bookstore. Give it, give it three years and we'll be there. But I looked at this last summer and I said, I think that if I can get in on this new genre right at the time when it is starting to gain speed, 
you know, I, I knew that Legends and Lattes had been picked up by Tor. I knew that they were going to do a re-release in the fall. And I was like, I have one summer to get this book out and to get it edited and to get it done. And if I can get my book out there and people know what it is, then I will be the one who's mentioned in the same breath as Legends and Lattes. And like, I feel bad piggybacking on Travis. He's been wonderful about that. But like, I absolutely sent him an email and was like, I'm planning on doing this. What do you think? And he talked it out with me and we did a couple Zoom sessions and and then I just kind of hit the ground running and did it, you know, and and that has been very successful for me. But I think that that was a very unique situation with a lot of luck involved, you know, like I'm able to write a book quickly and it's a good book, but the luck of finding a new genre does not come around very often, um, which is why it was, it felt necessary to leave my agent at the time, so. Yeah, and I think this is, this is something that we talk about like a lot in the industry is about that ability to pivot and also how to watch the markets mm -hmm. because I I don't think it's just cozy fantasy that's coming. I think sapphic fantasy is coming. Yes. And that oh, is why God, I hope so. <laughs> that is why I am writing sapphic yes. fantasy. Oh, because, I hope so. And this is a thing, like it only it only takes somebody to really watch the market, to look at the rankings, to see, to 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 have that perspective across social medias um and to see like what like what starts to turn and and you just take a chance like you know it this isn't it's calculated without being calculated because you know mm -hmm. we we could both be taking risks that actually fall flat next month and you, yeah, you don't know absolutely. but um yeah like this that is why I pivoted into sapphic fantasy because I was mm -hmm. like that this is this is coming there are there is nothing on the market I say nothing there's there's a handful of books but there is nothing on the market no but truly you can count them I mean there's probably under 30 truly good sapphic books and I say good with huge heavy quotes because they're all good but when you look at the books that are being promoted and pushed if you go into Barnes and Noble you'll find maybe 30 and like that's kind of horrifying when you consider how prolific the male male fan fiction is yeah. um or, you know, and not not to say that that is not an area that people also want to read, but I think that it's it's one of those things like, you know, lesbians have been underrepresented. There's that whole thing about like, like, oh, if you don't have the word lesbian in your book. And like, if you read my book, I don't have the word lesbian and I have it all over the marketing, but it's never shown up in the actual book because the world that I created was meant to be, it doesn't matter. There's no labels. Like no one has labels in my book. You I'm know? trying to um, think if I even put the word in my book now and I'm but, not even but trying. That's the thing. Like, yeah. like that's the thing that readers will look for. They look for the word because the word has such a negative connotation everywhere. You know, like nobody wants to write about lesbians because the word lesbian makes people cringe. So and this was my big thing, right? Because mm -hmm. I was like, this time I'm going to write to reader. I hate using the phrase write to market, but um, mm -hmm. I wanted to write to reader and I wanted to Love go that. into a market that I, that both I could write what I love but mm -hmm. also I was going to meet reader expectations. And yeah. so I, I've always loved fantasy. I've always written fantasy. So I knew it had to be fantasy. And then like, I just stumbled upon, upon like sapphic smart basically. And was like, yeah, oh, <laughs> so my life. Um, yep. and, and that was, that was it. Um, oh yeah. I wanted to write in a market that had opportunity and like the possibility to earn good money. Yeah which is why I chose fantasy romance, but also I wanted to write for me. And as a queer mm -hmm. woman, there aren't enough queer books out there for me. There really are. No. And so I kind of <laughs> hand tied myself because I knew that by having lesbian anywhere in the marketing, mm -hmm. I was going to, people are going to be put off by that. Mm -hmm. And like, so I knew that that was a problem, but what I did was I went, so like the cover that I've used is, mm -hmm more on the fantasy romance side yeah, absolutely. intentionally I did that mm -hmm. on purpose so that people don't just immediately think two women on the cover oh I'm not going to enjoy this but they pick mm -hmm. it up and give it a go so it's like yeah I don't know like we can be clever and tactical okay, in the way so that we market you and I books. have completely different tactics on marketing and this is actually fascinating to me because you specifically chose a cover that is more fantasy romance so that people don't look at it and say there's two women on the cover and the next cover for my next book when I tell you that it has two very sexy women on the cover, back to back, fighting for their fucking lives, I literally like it is going to be the most lesbian book. Like no one can pick up my book and be like, oh, this isn't about two women because I'm so annoyed that I got these one star reviews for people who rated the book one star because it quote unquote had lesbians. No reason about the book. They had nothing bad to say about the book itself, just that it had lesbians and they didn't know. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my. So like, 
if you look at my marketing, like everything on my marketing has, it has lesbians. It's all over. It's, it's over everywhere. And it sold me so many books. I it saw that on your A so plus content. Books. I loved it. Yeah. One of the things that I want to do mm-hmm. is have under the cover art that's female, female, mm-hmm. but yeah. it all costs money. And, you know, I basically oh, yeah. did this on well, a huge especially screen. For hard covers. I mean, God, yeah. I don't yeah. even have a hard cover in production because it's, I can't find somewhere reliable enough to print it that would be affordable for me. It's just not worth it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I love this so much. I haven't even I haven't even gotten to any of the bloody questions, but this is because this is so interesting to talk to you. Um, all right. So so coming back to TikTok, mm-hmm. you started in February last year, but yeah. when was your book released and kind of when did you start really working TikTok for the intention of the release? Yeah. So my book was released in September on September 15th. Um, I didn't start hitting the ground running with TikTok until probably June of that year. Um, But when I tell you that, like, all I was doing over the summer was promoting this book, like it wasn't even finished yet. And I was promoting it. And I think that's a thing, an area where a lot of people go wrong is that they assume that they just need to promote for the month before the book is published. But like, you have to let your readers know that they're coming down the pipeline. Um, So everybody already knows, like all my dedicated followers already know that I'm writing a sapphic fantasy horror. So when I come in and I have information about that book, people are going to be like, oh my God, I've been waiting for this one because they know it's coming. Um, So by pulling that pipeline through over three or four months before my actual release, it meant that when I released my art copies, even though nobody knew who I was, I still had 115 people filling out that form in 14 hours. You know, so like I was able to send out probably a hundred arc copies for can't spell treason without tea, which really helped build the vibe overall. Um, and it meant that I had a pretty successful release, but I will say that this book didn't really start picking up steam until December. Um, I made, you know, 1300, my first month dollars in royalties, uh, 2300 and 2400 in October and November, and then December hit and somehow just enough people had read it by that point that they started recommending it to their friends. They started promoting it on social media. And when Christmas came, oh my God, you know, like my sales just went through, they skyrocketed. And then, and then this month came and they haven't slowed down, you know? And I think that that's just a testimony to the fact that now cozy fantasy is really starting to take a hold in people's lives. Nobody really knew what it was before the end of last year. So I I don't know. I think this fantasy romance in general is slow build more Mm -hmm. than any other genre I've ever looked at. Like there is a tipping point where it seems to explode. And that is Mm -hmm. something common to quite a lot of authors that I've spoken to. Mm -hmm. Um, Why do you think TikTok is working? And do you think it works for every genre? You know, I hesitate to give umbrella statements about how TikTok can work for you, because I think that it depends a lot on the person and the personality behind their account. Um, I think that I tend to view TikTok as more of a community. So I approached it with like, if I get a thousand followers and they're cool people, I'm good. And I'd never needed to build from there. Um, I had one video go viral that got me probably 6,000 followers in the span of two or three weeks. Um, And it was about someone who pirated my novel and put it on a pirating website. And I basically said, if you have to download this book, feel free. And if you have the time, maybe leave me a review because like, I'm not going to sit here and judge people's financial situations or why they need to download those books. Um, And that was apparently a very fresh take that not a lot of authors take. So that video did very well for me. But overall, I think that when it comes down to genre by genre, I think that anybody can find success in TikTok if they're approaching it the right way with the right mindset behind them. You know, I, I think where in the same way that if you don't have a day job, you get a little more desperate to sell books and it stops becoming fun and starts becoming, oh my God, I'm not going to eat this month if I don't sell books. You know, in the same way that if you approach TikTok with that mindset, like, oh, I have to get this many followers or I will lose or I will not sell my book or I will fail suddenly now it it gets a lot less fun. Like you post a video and you feel this crushing defeat that you didn't get a thousand views versus when I post a video and I get 800 views, I'm like, wow, 800 people saw my book. You know, like it just, it makes it so easy for me to log back in and try again and again and again, because I never expected anything out of this. It was always just a platform that I meant, I was meant to enjoy. I treated it professionally, but it's for my enjoyment. It's not to sell books, you know? Um, so I think that it comes down to just the mindset that you approach that at. I, I couldn't say what would be popular next because I think that TikTok is a fickle fiend and it all depends on the algorithm. You know, <laughs> it, I think it's so interesting because like with the, with the sapphic fantasy romance, my whole ethos was to have fun. 
Mm-hmm. I was like, I am so tired of making um, like so this job. The, I, I quit my day job <laughs> mm-hmm. to work for myself, not to create another fucking soul sucking job. Mm-hmm. And that is what I did. And, and it like really took a minute to go, How, hold on a minute, we need to stop. And that's why I was like, nope, I'm going to write something that is so fun and yep. so like smutty and like, yes. like fast paced and bantery and that is just all of the things that I love um I can't, I can't wait to read it I have I've had it on my like to buy list on Amazon for a minute I'm gonna go and buy it because oh. I'm like I, I read some I read some smutty books over winter break and as a longtime fan fiction writer I was very disappointed in the smut because I was just like this is not set like it was like so like it was like pg like it was explicit but it was like pg explicit and I was just like I'm looking for like the stuff that makes your jaw drop. Yeah, you know? yeah that's what yeah. I get in fan fiction, and I have yeah. not found that yet. So, but chapter fantasy three. romance different beasts than contemporary. So, Ch- chapter three. That's okay. that's the one I always see, see people chapter like... three right away. I love that. I'm <laughs> like, get, well, get me hooked with the sexy, and then let's go into the plot from there. You know, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think. But the thing is about TikTok, it is such like I, I say so I'm friends with AK Malford, and they were saying like. TikTok is just a hotbed of hot mess. And I was like, yes, I found my yeah. people. I yeah, live life as a hot mess. And like, that's what makes different it different than something like Instagram or Twitter, because on there yeah. you have Twitter's professional, right? Like professional, quote unquote. I mean, like you have a certain expectation of who's looking at your Twitter feed. You know, it's agents, it's it's editors, it's, you know, people. And, and that kind of sucks. And then Instagram comes in and it's like, oh, everything must be perfect all of the time. Yes, but then like, TikTok comes in and I'm like, I record videos while I'm sipping my morning coffee before I've even fixed my hair. Yeah. And, and, and those videos get 5,000 views, you know, and then yes. I fix my hair and I look really pretty and I get a nice background and they get like 800 views. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> let me just uh, lower my expectations for life right now. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, okay. So one of the things that I love um, about your content is that you do mini tutorials for mm-hmm. um, like writers and authors. Yeah. And one of them that you did recently talks about the main types of content that is useful to post. And I wondered if you could run through some of those and like how authors can use them yeah so um the one of the okay so there's two parts to this that video had two parts the first part is the obvious like types of videos that you can put out so everybody does those aesthetic videos right like they put pictures up to music and that's that those don't do very well in my experience i've i've seen they were doing really well last summer um i haven't seen one do well since last summer is this so like the my, page flips and all yeah the, like the page yeah. flipping yeah yeah well the words on the screen are a bit different um but I'm talking like you you're know, like would you read this book with and then you have like just like picture aesthetic 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 you know and those don't seem like they're selling like they don't seem like they're getting the traction that they could be um slideshows if you have to do those the slideshow format is being pushed a lot right now on the algorithm but that could change in the next couple of months um, yeah, so the slideshow ones are very useful. Um, from what I can tell, the ones that have really picked up for me are like the dance videos where I'm waving my physical book around on camera. Um, the acting videos where I pretend like I'm one of my characters to kind of show like a funny thing. Like I had one video where it was like the um like that God fucking damn it, Dave, right? Like we've all heard that that audio clip. And so I did one where it was like, you know, my one character just wants to sit and have her cup of tea. And then like her other characters, like my other character is challenging an entire dragon armada. And I ran around with a lighter, you know, to pretend. And then I, and then like, you know, the girl sitting having a cup of tea is just like, fuck, like I gotta go save my girlfriend now, you know? And, <laughs> and that video got like 12,000 views and sold me a bunch of books, you know? But that was stupid, right? Like it was stupid. Um, I do, but it one, worked because that's what of, TikTok loves is stupid. One of um, my first I, videos was the Wednesday dance. And I was like, when your book makes Wednesday yeah. Adams look like like uh-huh. yep. child's play or something. And I just like, and I can't fucking dance. And literally I I I was like dying. Pieces of my soul died whilst oh, I did no, that. Oh no, same. But I was just like, oh, well, fuck it. Let's just fucking, you know. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly it. Like the stupider you look, the more vulnerable you become. That's what people are looking for. And there's this whole trend in marketing right now where companies are panicking because they cannot cater to Gen Z the way they could cater to millennials. Mm. Um, and because, and it's because, you know, Gen Z is like 
fuck all of the fakeness. So show me your authentic self and maybe mm-hmm. we'll get on board. And that's the best advice that I can bring up to authors right now is like, show them your authentic self. You can be stupid. You can look like an idiot. You can forget to fix your hair, put your makeup on. And when I've, I, one of the big things that I've heard from a lot of authors is that they're not comfortable showing their face, which fair, you know, I understand why you would not be comfortable doing that. But if the whole reason is that you don't feel like you're attractive enough, get on camera anyway, because it doesn't matter on TikTok. Like there's a thousand and one people out there that I follow, you know, who they're just, they're, they're just living their best life, you know, and that's what I love to watch. Like I want to watch those people just existing in nature in the way that people do. Um, and I think that that's something that can very much help if you, if you have to avoid showing your face, um, some things that I've seen people get really cool masks and they'll wear those and then they'll do the dancing videos, but they'll have the mask on. They'll make it like a part of their identity, a part of their marketing strategy where they cover their face. Um, I've seen people who have like cut their top of their face off. Like there's one account I follow that's like the headless, you know, and they like lift themselves up like this and all you can see is their body (laughs) and, and that, and that's that, you know, and like every video is that way. So there's creative ways to get away with not showing your face, but think hard about why you don't want to be on camera. Because if the answer is, I'm afraid people will judge me, TikTok will not judge you. You know, like that's just, and maybe I'm on a good side of TikTok, but like I would not tolerate being judged at this point, you know, like, no, no. (laughs) So I don't know. I, who knows how the algorithm works. And so some of the other types of content that you talked about um, in the post include Oh, um, yeah. So the second part of that was campaigns. Um, so hopefully you can edit out some of this. <laughs> a lot. Sorry. Um, so the second part was talking about campaigns. Um, and this is something that I feel like has sold me more books than any of those singular videos have, because I pull those con that content through many, many videos. Um, but they have to happen organically. So they're inherently a higher tier level of marketing than anything else, because you can't just make up a campaign. Um, you have to have an opportunity fall into your lap. So some examples are when I first published my book, I accidentally made, um, you know, I made a copy of the file and then I uploaded the copy without realizing that on every other page, it would say can't spell treason without T copy. Um, And someone alerted me the day after publication, hey, these are on all of my books. And I was like, oh shit. And I had to go back in and change the copy copy to be normal copies, right? So now it's fixed. I think there's like 38 of them flying around. Um, And the copy copies have become a campaign for me where people who have them brag about the fact that they have them because that's like, that's a first edition print right there. You know, like that was a mistake that I didn't mean to make, but like people love those. So I'm planning on bringing some of that through some of my future books, like the copy copies, right? Um, Another campaign is that I sent a book to this girl um, in the UK and uh, someone stole the copy out of her mailroom. And she made a video where she was just like, to the person who stole this book out of my mailroom, like, I hope you enjoyed this cozy fantasy of two lesbians opening up a bookshop. Like, and that video got some views and I watched it and I was like, I can fix this. So I made a video where I just was like, I mean, I was laughing so hard that day. Like I was cracking up at the idea of this thief stealing this gay book about these two women who open up a bookshop. Um, And so I, I made this video, I sent her another one, she received it. And then like, she made a video about that. But like, that was a fun campaign that I brought through probably about a month. I mean, we were making videos back and forth for probably about a month about that. Um, the most recent campaign that I'm running is obviously the, it has lesbians marketing campaign. Um, and like, I, it's because I got one star reviews and I got enough of them that they made me feel like shit, you know? Cause I was like, if you're going to tell me my book is bad, that's fine. But like, don't just tell me you won't read it because it has lesbians. Cause I would never go onto a straight book and say that, oh, won't read this. It has a hetero couple. Like, you know, like what the <laughs> one star, like, can you imagine? I mean, like, can you imagine that? So I'm just like, this literally like this feels homophobic to me and I hate it. And I was like, I know that I'm not supposed to, as an author, get involved in reader spaces. We still read them, but I just, I keep my, I keep my mouth shut. Right. But that, that, that hurt me. So I went online and I made this video where I was just like, guys, please come on. And I was like, do I need to put a big bit? Cause like, I thought it was pretty obvious. It had, you know, it said a girl and her girlfriend in the cover, in the back cover summary. So in my mind, but everyone's like, oh no, girlfriends can be anything. I'm like, hmm, hmm. <laughs> not always, you know? Um, so I made this video where I was like, do, should I just make a banner that says it has lesbians? And everybody was like, I would read the shit out of a book that had a banner that said it has lesbians. So I went and I made the banners. 
And I made a separate video where I was like, here are the banners I came up with. What do you guys think? And that video got a ton of views and everyone was like, holy shit, I didn't know your book had lesbians. So I put the banner on Amazon because people really liked it. So now if you go to my Amazon page, you can see the banner that says, in case there's confusion, it has lesbians. And like when I saw that, I was literally like, that's literally the best A plus content I have ever seen, ever. It is. It, is, <laughs> it, it has told me I have made so much money off of those homophobic comments I've made so much money. Like the gays win again, right? Because like I've made, I've sold so many books because of that. It has lesbians. So I keep bringing it back up because people still like it. So I'm like, until this is tired, I'm going to continue to be like, hey, it has lesbians. So the dedication in my second book is to those people who made me so much money by giving me one star reviews. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think because I, funnily enough, I have done, I have used a one star review once before and it and it's so I write nonfiction writing craft books and one mm-hmm. of them was like um often they say one star this would have been good if it weren't for the swearing to which I'm like don't fucking <laughs> read it then um but the other the other the other you one about Elise Myers thing find less yeah yeah <laughs> if you can't handle me find less <laughs> exactly exactly um somebody was like um oh this book like if you can imagine if Deadpool were a professor this is what it would have been like like to be in their class and I was like are you fucking kidding me Deadpool's like my favorite film I was like that's like the biggest compliment ever I know I was like best (laughs) review ever and I plastered it everywhere Uh and it worked like like, because it's self-selecting right people who like Deadpool are gonna like my books are gonna absolutely adore that yeah exactly and so Mm -hmm. yeah I think that I think this is so wonderful to turn what could be a negative into a positive Mm -hmm. um I also think it's really interesting because a lot of authors are told not to talk about like writing um to their fiction audience and so Mm -hmm. What I find interesting about what you do is that you include your community, maybe not so much like in in like writing advice, but in your process. And I think that's what's interesting. Um, Yeah. Well, so my my tackle on that is like, I believe that every fiction reader is a budding writer. I and I know that that's might that might not be true for everybody. Some people truly just enjoy to read. But in my experience, everybody starts reading. And then eventually they start coming up with their own ideas. And then eventually they decide that they want to put pen to paper and then they become writers. So in my brain, I know that people are like, oh, I keep my writers and my readers separate. But in my mind, they're all the same person. Like every reader, every reader has a potential to be a writer and every writer should be reading. So if you're not blending those lines, I I think you're missing out on a huge audience of people who, who maybe don't believe that they could do it because maybe they've been told that their writing is not good. So they read, you know, and I'm like, that's, that's not true. You're writing can be good if you get to it in practice and and it's done so much for me that I want others to find that benefit you know like I writing is everything to me um and I feel like if if I can help convince one other person that it's everything to them that is a good life you know you've you've talked a lot about community and why it's important to you so I Mm -hmm. wonder if you could um just go into a few details about how you fostered community on TikTok yes so community on TikTok I think I don't know. I just, I think that, I think the community is everything that an author should be, you know, like it, they, they call a lot of people will call it their street team. I would never use that because in my brain, everybody is my street team. Everybody who enjoyed my book will then turn around and promote my book to the people in their lives. Um, so I don't feel the need to designate an entire street team. I don't feel, I don't feel like that helps. I think that if you treat all of TikTok as your street team. You know, all of these people are just looking for good content. They want they want someone that they can get behind as an author who writes really quality things. And if you can present that to them, they will come and they will come in droves, you know? And, and some people get frustrated because they may push their book out maybe before it's early, maybe they're not quite the writer that they will be in a couple of years, you know? But if they get discouraged then and they never keep trying, you know, like I have so many hard drive, I have so many books in my hard drive that never went anywhere. I have so many rejections amassed. I mean, over 300 rejections from agents over the course of three novels, you know, it's just, you just got to get back on the horse and keep going. And, and I think that that is where TikTok becomes that community for me because it's a lot of encouraging authors convincing you to get back on and try again. And it's a lot of encouraging readers who will find you because you got back on the horse. 
Um, and if you don't treat it like a community, I just, I don't know. I feel like you're going to be disappointed. I feel like you go in with the wrong mindset if the community is not there. So I think so much of this business is just sheer bloody minded persistence mm-hmm. because, you know, so one of um, the big indie authors, uh, Elena Johnson, I don't know if you know, she writes sort of sweet, uh, Rome, sweet Christian romance, Western stuff or something, wow. or something along those lines. Anyway, seven figure author. She's massive. Wow. But she but she's written nearly 200 books and she Mm -hmm. talks about the fact that it was not her ninth book her ninth series before she made any good money and Mm -hmm. I'm like yeah like that is persistence yep that is what we have to do and Mm -hmm. and so many of us like come in I don't know I I don't want to I just feel like no matter how much we try to come in with our eyes open, mm-hmm. I still feel like we have creative hope and, and we hope it's going to happen really quickly and really soon. And like, uh-huh. it's fucking grueling when it doesn't. Like, you know, you put so much time and effort into that yeah. first series. My first mm-hmm. series completely flopped. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm just lucky that my nonfiction did very well. Mm-hmm. That enabled me to leave my day job. But my my first series didn't. But I didn't write to reader. You know, my... Mm-hmm. This a game of hearts and heists has already outsold on mm-hmm. pre-order my mm-hmm. the last book in my fiction series. So yeah. I'm like, this is the difference when you find the niche that you and can write have creative want. joy, mm-hmm. but yeah. also meet reader expectations. Yeah. Like, and that's that's what this is about. Do you think there are any mistakes writers should make with? Uh, uh, I was like, I think there's make. a lot of mistakes writers should make. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do, do you think there's any that they should avoid on TikTok? Anything to avoid on TikTok? Um, who? That's a good one. Um, I, I honestly, I mean, bigotry of any kind. Obviously, like if you think that you're right and people of color are telling you you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, period, full stop. You're wrong. Um, and I think that that is something that a lot of white authors, especially, fall into. Um, you know, I think, I think that's that... the same for like queer communities, disabled communities, yeah, like mm-hmm. any com- yeah. mental health communities, yeah. like any mm-hmm. com- any um, diverse community that any tells you you're wrong. Community yeah. that tells you you're wrong. Yeah. You're wrong. Exactly. Exactly. You're wrong. You know, yeah. and and getting over the hubris of no, I'm not, and not digging your heels in is absolutely key to navigating something like that. You know, I mean, I when I first went out with Treason and Tea, I used um, they them, and I had the word non-binary in my writing, and I had multiple people reach out to me and say, hey. Um, appreciate the book, but it shouldn't be non-binary. You should use gender neutral to describe those pronouns because otherwise you're basically implying that non-binary equals they, them. And there's a lot of other pronouns out there. So it was a lot of, um, you know, that was, that was a, I would say, I'll say a humbling moment for me, but also a learning moment for me. And as a future professor, I love learning. So I was like, oh shit, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. I made a video that I was just like, for anybody reading the arc, please know this will change. I paid the fees to get a new copy uploaded on Ingram Spark. And I learned a lot about that, you know, and that was something that I had been alerted to with a community that I am not a part of because I wanted to accomplish good representation. And since then, I've had people from that community reach out and tell me that I've done that character really well, and they love them, you know? And and they're like, oh my gosh, this character is everything that I wanted them to be. But I think that that growth couldn't have happened if I hadn't been able to step back from my own bullshit, you know? Um, And I think that that's, again, why I wouldn't quit my day job. You know, I, I learn a lot more about my bullshit when I'm interacting with people in those communities. Yeah, absolutely. I think so much of this is about just staying humble and having an open mind because mm-hmm. we can all all grow, we can all be wrong, we can all change, we can all yeah. like we all have potential and just being willing to admit that mm-hmm. makes so many of our mistakes like I don't want to say like okay but understandable like so many people mm-hmm. will be more understandable if you yeah. can just put your hands up and go oh my gosh like I, I just no didn't idea. know mm-hmm. yeah 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 and then um, you fix it yeah <clears throat> yeah so in, exactly as, in, as a south as a flight attendant you know one of the things southwest teaches us is the last method which is the listen apologize solve and thank method and I use that every day on the airplane if someone comes on super angry I literally just move through those motions the listen and you have to actually listen we're like you're understanding what they're saying and you're bringing it to your attention you apologize sincerely you know like you are genuinely sorry 
Um, you solve the problem, which is the big one, because listening and apologizing doesn't do enough. You have to actually go in and fix the issue. And then you thank them for their time because they didn't have to alert you to that problem at all. Um, and that type of mentality approaching on TikTok, I think, is the best way that an author can go about. You know, everybody gets so afraid to write diverse characters, but the diverse people are, I mean, marginalized communities are not scary. They don't have to be scary. They're resources, but you also have to recognize that if they're taking the time to inform you of something, it is your duty as an author to accept that information and use it, you know? Okay. Do you, are there any things that you think an author should do on TikTok running up to a launch? Um, promoting beforehand is huge. Um, like I said, you should be starting months in advance uh, to promote your book, even just by saying, hey, I'm writing a book that's going to have these things. Um, I think that hitting the tropes in a book is really useful on TikTok because it gives a very clear cut idea of what they can expect. Make sure that they're accurate because we've had some, you know, the um, what is it, Alex Astor, Lightlark thing that, I mean, that was promising. So it was a whole thing where um, for the author of Light Lark promised tropes that she didn't really deliver. Um, and she went viral off of those tropes. And everyone was like, they're not in the book. So like, make sure that you have that whole thing. There was other things with that, but that was the big one. Um, so tropes, I think, are a really useful mentality to promote on TikTok. Um, and then I think it's just not expecting overnight success. You know, I mean, most books grow in audience if they're good. If, you know, if, if they're of a certain quality, people will want to recommend them to their friends and their family and then their friends and family read them and they want to recommend them. But reading takes time. So you have to expect that your launch may not be great. But over the course of several months, you may find opportunities landing in your inbox that you wouldn't have expected before. Um, and I think that that's something very important to keep in mind just for an expectation on the reader's side and the writer's side. You know, I. You just don't know what a book will become. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any advice for creating content? Get stupid. <laughs> get stupid and get out there. You know, I mean, I think that I, I post two to three times a day and there are days where I have ideas that I can post eight and there are days that I have ideas where I can post one and I'm lucky if I get out one, you know, but I am consistently on that app every single day. Even when I'm working, I try to post at least one video a day. Um, and I think that it's just a lot of, you know, like ideas generate ideas in the same way as writers, you can't, you start to come up with more book ideas when you're writing your current book. Um, ideas generate ideas. So get out there and start making content and you'll be surprised at how many more ideas your brain comes up with as you're creating more content. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing that I do is I save a lot of sounds. Yes. Um, and then I save trending sounds, <laughs> save sounds and then go, go through them. That's, yep. that's a point. Where do you find trending sounds? How do you find a trending sound? Um, the for you page, hands down, I just all sit with my morning coffee pretty much every morning and I'll scroll for about 10 minutes and I'll start to, <clears throat> sorry, um, I'll start to look for things that repeat, um, sounds that repeat. And then I just start saving those sounds because there's a good chance that they're going to be trending. One thing to note is if you start to save sounds that are trending, make those videos quick because the algorithm will move on to a new trending sound. And if you make a trending sound three weeks after the, after the fact, it's not going to do as well as it would have if you'd made it that day. Um, so like I said, I, I have a lot of video like audio saved, but most of the older ones I won't touch anymore because they're not, you know, some of them are classic. They'll come up again and again over the course of several months, but most of them will just kind of fade into the nether. Like the corn video one, you know, it's corn, a big, lump, big, see, you don't even know what it is. The corn video, that sound was huge back in like September and like, you can't even find it anymore. It's not anywhere on that algorithm now. So I, I think that that's something good to know. Like the trending sounds do not trend for long. So get out there and start making content on them when you find them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anything technical that maybe, I don't know about hashtags or um, like how often we should post, Any anything technical that we really should know? So uh, no one really knows. And if they try to pretend like they do, they're lying to you because the algorithm is a big mystery. And we've recently learned that People on TikTok can make any video go viral with the press of a button. Um, so like it's literally people at TikTok headquarters deciding what goes viral and what doesn't. So you'll never win. <laughs> you'll never win if you try to get specific advice. You know, the only thing that I've consistently found that works is to post every day if you can. And if you can't, that's OK. Um, and to, you know, and, and the hashtags I use, I pretty much always go for off, hashtag author talk, hashtag writer talk, hashtag book talk, hashtag book. And those are on every single and then hashtag for your FYP um, that sometimes puts it on the for you page. 
Um, but like everything else, it's like, you never really know. I did an experiment where I posted six videos in a day because I heard that six to seven videos in a day can get you more views. And I found that that was true on that one day, but a lot of other people in the comment section went in and tried it and they said that it didn't work for them. So who the hell knows, (laughs) you know, (laughs) who knows? Do you find there are particular times of day that work for you? I don't watch that. I, I, I work my day around like my day, TikTok is included in my day, no matter what my day is. And I don't work my day around TikTok. So I don't save drafts. I post things pretty much when I find them. Um, and I will just kind of post throughout the day whenever I feel the urge. Um, oh so I haven't really experimented on certain times of day yet. That kills me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I, because I, I don't know. I like, I'm anxious even thinking about not having like some drafts of things that can post like, <laughs> I think, I don't know, like, I think because I think having a kid, like over the pandemic, Mm -hmm. having a kid showed me that I can never rely on having time. And Mm -hmm. so like, for me, like having a backup of like potential videos that I could post if I don't get the time to then do one day. You don't need to have that backlog of potential videos because at any point you can go back into the videos you've already made, pull the um, logo off of it with one of those websites Um, you know, where you can just upload the thing and it pulls the TikTok logo off the video and then just repost that video and you're good and it's all done. So yeah, like you can, like I've reposted videos. Um, There's one video that I reposted. The first time I posted it, it got 40,000 views. The second time I posted it, it got 14,000 views. And (sighs) like, and I, and I did absolutely no extra effort except pulling the logo off of it and putting it back up on a day that I didn't have time to do anything else. So I think that that's something to remember. Yeah. Okay. I, I haven't reused anything. I mean, I haven't, I, I did the mistake of only doing it a month before, but that's partly because Mm -hmm. it was Christmas the month before that. And our December was crazy. And then November, I can't remember what was I, I can't remember what happened in anyway. Um, Mm -hmm. I, and also I had multiple full starts. So I started TikTok three times with three different pen names before yep. I was like, nope, this nope. is the one. Here we Get go. Yeah. yeah. And and it just so happened that it was only a month before. But the difference, I suppose, is that I will continue. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, and everything will get easier from here. Yeah, yeah. I knew I was starting for the long haul. And also this is because this is my only uh, social media for this for Ruby because Sasha yeah. is like my, my normal pen name mm-hmm. although it, they're both open pen names <clears throat> yeah. but um yeah I was like I knew I was committing because I don't I can't handle any more fucking platforms yeah. or social media I was like that's it this well, is and the that's kind of it I'm like I know a lot of authors will have multiple pen names and in my experience my right like everything that I write is going to be sapphic anyway at this point like I'm not really writing anything else right now not to say I wouldn't in the future but it's going to be sapphic or lgbt somewhere so I tend to grab the lgbt audience but like my my cozy fantasies are just one genre so I'm going to be publishing a fantasy horror later this year. Um, I have another book that's a contemporary magical realism that I may or may not publish this year. We'll see. Um, But I'm not planning on making any new pen names for those. And I already have a middle grade book published under Rebecca Thorne. So like you can go and find my middle grade book under Rebecca Thorne. Um, And I'm not making any new pen names because I'm like, it's enough work to do one, (laughs) you know, like, and you never know which one will become big. And I don't want people to not be able to find my middle grade stuff because I am now writing adult. Like for all I know, I might find, you know, a reader who has a kid and they may want to read that book together with their child. And like, if I didn't have the same pen name for it, they wouldn't know. And I'm not writing any more middle grade. So it's not like that. It's not like I could do anything with that book on its own and make it its own marketing. Like middle grade is pretty much done for me now, you know? So yeah. Yeah. I I think it's so interesting. There are so many different reasons for like doing, having multiple pen names, not having multiple pen names Mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So, okay. I think that brings me to the end of all of my TikTok questions. Uh, Thank you so much for Mm -hmm, answering all this. (laughs) However, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Um, so my degree is in criminal justice. My my bachelor's is in criminal justice. Um, and I thought I was going to be a cop for most of my college career. Um, I did not. I ended up going into being a flight attendant instead because they were the ones who hired me and that just set me on that path. But Um, when I was in college, I was very straight laced. I didn't drink until I was 21. I, you know, like I grew up in a Mormon community, right? Like, so I'm, again, I'm not Mormon, but I grew up in that Mormon community. So like, it was very 
very straight laced, right? Like our idea of a party was Monopoly. I'm <laughs> not even joking. Um, okay. So, yep. So when I got to college, I wanted to have a story that I could tell, and I still do. Um, so I went on a date with this guy, first date, and I decided that we should break into the university stadium. And I say break into, we just hopped a fence. Like there was one area where another guy had shown me that you could theoretically hop the fence and go into the university stadium. So at the University of Arizona, um, I hopped the fence with him and we went into, and all we did was go down on the football field and kind of wander the bleachers and like look at the stars. And then like we left, right? Like there was no damage, there was no anything. But um, as we were coming down, we were looking out for cop cars And, uh, and I, you know, and I saw somebody on a bike coming and I was like, okay, we got to get down quick. So I jumped down and he like, and he hovered at this wall and like, wouldn't jump down because it was too far of a jump. And he was just like, ah, ah. And I was like, just, 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 just. The bike turned out to be a bicycle cop. Oh no. (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, actively saw us jumping off of the wall. (laughs) came right over took our ids and i had to go through a diversion program and take a responsibility course and no oh yeah all that jazz Uh, i was on academic probation for a bit i'm like i'm like a 4.0 student right like a plus i mean like (laughs) yeah so oh my goodness that was my rebel moment um fun fact i did not stop there i actually did jump we we called it roof hopping because we would literally like swing around the metal bars that like blocked you from getting onto the roof of some of those buildings um, and so we would like over like a nine foot, a nine, st- a nine story drop, we would like swing around the gate and like climb, keep climbing up. We didn't have to open up any doors. We didn't have to pick any locks, which I also know how to do, but <laughs> for, for research purposes, for research purposes. Oh my God. Um, this is incredible. Yeah. Oh my so God. I love that's, it. That's my rebel moment. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books and anything else that you'd like to add. Yeah. So um, my website is going to be my best place. TikTok is the second best. Um, The website will have the most updated information. I do have a newsletter that you can sign up for. Um, I I, I don't email hardly ever, uh, but I do send out emails. If I have like ARC copies that need to be distributed, the newsletter people get first access on that. Um, I'll send out short stories on occasion just to my newsletter people. Um, so that's useful if you guys want to sign up for that. Um, and then TikTok is going to be the best place to get day-to-day updates because I post all the time and you get to know a lot about me and my writing and my process. So yeah, TikTok website, and then Amazon is where my books are. So amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was so fun. (laughs) I've absolutely loved talking to you. It's been a pleasure. And of course, thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Rebecca Thorne, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. This week, I am joined by one of my fave humans, JJ Arias, and we are going to be talking all about how to create conflict in romance. And this, you guys are going to love this because I know you always love when I talk to my friends, and JJ is one of my friends, and we have... (laughs) We have, it. look, I'm really excited for you to listen to this one. So make sure you uh, uh, come back next week and listen to that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.